slide of yours. After lunch, everybody I think knows that it's the worst time to be in the audience, it's the worst time to be a speaker, as everybody's digestion systems are trying to absorb lunch. But I do hope that uh, we have your full attention for this session, which is all about blockchain for a sustainable society. We've heard about how important it is, blockchain for the people. And we're going to begin this session with a keynote speaker who comes from the Canadian government and wants to make the delivery of services faster, quicker, and more seamless and simpler. Please give a round of applause for the Director General of Digital Government at Innovation, Science and Economic Development Department in the Government of Canada, Vidya Shankar Narayan. Thank you. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I totally agree that uh, being the first speaker right after lunch is uh, not easy for me and not that easy for you. But let's see if I can get the energy going a little. So I am from the government of Canada. So I've come all the way from Ottawa, Canada to Malaga and absolutely enjoying it here. And the more and more I see what is happening around the world, I'm actually quite thrilled to be here in front of you. So just giving you a snapshot. So Canada, second largest country in the world. Population of just over 37 million. GDP of 1.9 trillion. Canada basically has businesses, small, medium, and large, all put together to about 1.2 million. Out of the 1.2 million businesses in Canada, 97.9% .9 of them are small businesses across the country. Another 1.9 are medium-sized businesses and just 0.2% are large businesses which have over 500 employees. These stats, I mean, it's very easy to find these stats, but the reason I'm mentioning them is because my focus in today's uh, conversation or basically my keynote is actually going to be how do we actually as governments use blockchain to better serve our business population within our countries but also across borders. I'm going to directly jump into how do we actually because blockchain I mean it's yes it is fairly new but many of us who've been in the technology realm have heard about blockchain for a long time. And for many, it's seen as tech. Typically, most of my friends say, hey, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. They usually think of fintech, technology, and there's a lot of fear as well when they hear about blockchain and exchange of information. What I'd like to actually demystify today and plant a seed of a new business model with respect to digital identification of businesses in order to make government to business and business to business interactions faster and seamless. Based on the latest report, and actually the numbers you see there have already gone up a lot. The, the last report, Gartner, which is a company that does worldwide research, has predicted the value of blockchain will reach 3.1 trillion in just about 10 years. And I can tell you that number has gone up since they published that report. Quickly moving to why do we say digital, ide digital identity and blockchain? It's actually the perfect way to enable self-sovereign identity. Canada has a digital charter that came into effect in 2019, basically earlier this year. And I'm sure, depending on where you are in the world, you have your individual regulations and charters. The issue we have is we have a digital charter in Canada which clearly stipulates that an individual and a business is responsible for their own identity. How do they want to maintain it? How do they want to share it? However, also keeping in mind, 
privacy does not mean anonymity. Privacy is not about saying, okay, I'm not going to share anything. The other extreme is people share too much. So how do we actually find that balance and give the control to the businesses or to the individuals to share their identity? For businesses, businesses right from creating your actual business registry, right to the point of having your IP, to the point of commerce and trade within your country and with other countries, you require an entire series of permits, regulations, contracts, etc. And right now, and I would bet that this is not just in Canada, but this is across most parts of the world, a lot of it is in paper, or even if some of it is digital, it is separately maintained. And also, each time you have to have a transaction, you have to provide significant amount of information every time. Now the argument is, I'm not saying we're going to jump to putting everything into one central repository. Absolutely not. The argument that I'm proposing from a business model perspective is, how do you enable digital identity for business using blockchain, where there is no one central repository, it's a federated model. The first point when it came to digital ID for business across borders, and I'm not kidding, this was Canada being the second largest country in the world, just one end of Canada to, another, to the other end, I believe, is about 7,000 miles. Just businesses transacting with each other within the country was like traversing borders. And this is where we started off by saying, how do we use information that is already available within each of the provinces, which are basically called states in other countries, how can we reuse information using a federated model where we set up trust? Setting up the trust is where blockchain comes in because without having trust, we can't actually grow the economy. And each business in the self-sovereign model actually takes control of what do they share, whether they want to share who are their list of directors? Do they want to share the different cities and provinces and, and countries they are actually operating in? Secondly, business can also save all of their permits, licenses, IP information into wallets. Once again, completely private. However, they are able to share the information with respect to an affirmation or a negation when they need to use that specific permit, license, IP, any of the regulatory items. Many of you who have been in the blockchain domain for the last little while, I'm sure are familiar with the term verifiable claim or claim. The concept that I'm putting forward is how can we actually set up verifiable claims for all of the business related information so that businesses can do simpler, faster, business within the country as well as across borders. Now in EU, I find the model fascinating because you have a significantly large number of countries who are working together. In North America, Canada is standing on its own, then we have US, we have Mexico. We don't have that kind of exchange that you have here. Now I can go completely to another extreme. Recently I was speaking to folks in Africa population of Africa is 1.3 billion and about 500 million of that population does not have any form of identity. So here, instead of starting with physical identity and keeping everything separate, they have an opportunity to leapfrog. Leapfrog into how can they actually apply blockchain and set up verifiable claims so that self-sovereign identity becomes their identity as they move forward. Just switching gears quickly is blockchain is fairly new when it comes to for most of our lives, I would say. And I, when I started off, I mentioned that this, there is fear. I'm speaking from my day-to-day -day work. When I speak about blockchain, I get a number of questions about GDPR, about with regards to cybersecurity, with regards to cost, and the list goes on and on. 
I see this as a great opportunity for us to actually be part of setting the standards. Standards are required and values are primordial. Without having the right value system for setting up the verifiable claims and setting up the blockchain networks of the future, we won't be able to move forward. That said, how do we actually balance the passion and the intelligence along with diminishing the fears that exist and manage the risks associated with the fears. Let's start by experimenting. Let's start small and grow from there. This is where I put forward some very basic collaboration opportunities. I know I'm coming from really over the ocean from, uh, I should have said actually collaboration across continents versus just across borders because when we're looking at the global economy, it's no longer just Canada or the US or the EU or Africa, is how can we actually reduce the burden, the administrative burden for our economies across the globe to grow is significant because of the lack of trust, the lack of actually exchange of the correct information. So this is where I'm putting here three opportunities for collaboration research and development, and being here is actually the beginning of it with regards to how can we identify some key use cases. Maybe it's one, maybe it's two, and how can we collaborate? Here I've mentioned EU, it can be with other countries, this is just an example. Standards is huge. I think now it's been over 30 years ago when the World Wide Web was set up. At that time I was, I was not too young, but I was still young enough that I was not part of the standard setting. Now, for many of us here, we can actually be pioneers in setting up the standards with regards to how do we apply blockchain in setting up digital trust and identity, whether within our countries, within our societies, or across countries. Interoperability is fundamental and key. Without interoperability, security, and scalability, there is actually no point in setting up any of the technology frameworks. And based on the amount of open technologies we have right now, I'd say interoperability should be fairly easy to test and prove out. Last but not least is regulatory, re regulatory review, or I should say is regulatory reform. I've said a little bit with regards to IP, I've spoken about permits, licenses, etc. How can we test test out use cases that expand the regulatory environments beyond just our borders within our countries and go global. So I'd say that is uh, my quick message and I hope this conversation will continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vidya, for that call for collaboration and for common standards and for creating the infrastructure. We're now going to go to a panel, and the panel is going to look at these questions. How can blockchain address sustainability issues and cultivate new business models? How can blockchain have a meaningful social impact? Well, to answer those questions, you're in the very capable hands of our moderator, Stefan Unistrand, PhD in architect, and is an expert in smart cities, sustainability, and blockchain. Stefan, the floor is yours. Welcome everybody to this, I would say, super interesting roundtable with the title Blockchain for Sustainable Society and New Business Models. Please let me first introduce our four, I would say, also amazing panelists from India, Tanvi Ratna, Global Blockchain Policy and Regulation Specialist, Founder and CEO of Policy 4.0. From the United Kingdom, 
Simona Pop, a communication and strategy specialist, co-founder of Bounties Network. And from Sweden, Ariane Rodert, president of the section for the single market production and consumption at the European Economic and Social Committee. And finally from Scotland, Graham Douglas, senior European leader at Oracle. In this session, we will dig deep into the current perspective use cases for distributed te ledger technologies and addressing real-world economic and sustainable challenges. We will refer to sustainability as the meeting of the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet it. And during this debate, I will try to make sure that we all cover the pillars of sustainability from an economic, environmental and social perspective. And as a starting point, I have asked the speakers to make a quick presentation of themselves so we all get a picture who, of who they are and what they do within the blockchain space. Tanvi, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, so I'm Tanvi Ratna. I'm the founder and CEO of Policy 4.0. Uh, we are a policy advisory um, team in India. Uh, my background is uh, entirely in policy making, so I used to work uh, earlier in the US government, I used to work on the Hill when Secretary Clinton was in office, um, and I moved to India uh, about six years ago uh, to work with uh, Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister of India, and um, I was the, previously the blockchain lead at Ernst & Young as well. Um, and my uh, team, uh, Policy 4.0, uh, next slide. If you can go, Stefan, the next slide. I'm really trying to make them show the PowerPoints now. Okay, okay it's now. Now it's up. Okay, I'm sorry. That's, Here. that's fine. Uh, so Policy 4.0 uh, works on policy for the fourth uh, industrial revolution. Uh, and we especially focus on some new paradigms uh, in policy making. So currently we're advising uh, a large state government in India who are building uh, what, what will be the largest blockchain in the world. Uh, it will cover services to 10 million citizens. Uh, it is likely going to cover most uh, government services and government departments in that state. Um, so how do we actually design and roll out such an initiative? How do we unlock value at the bottom of the pyramid? Uh, those are questions uh, that I deal with. Thank you, Tanvi. Really interesting and many questions we'll take up in the discussion later. Simona. Hello. Um, so I'm Simona. I'm a co-founder of the Bounties Network. Um, it is a project built on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and the whole idea of um, the product is a protocol as well as a product, um, and it's a very, very simple format. A bounty is essentially a task, somebody fulfills it, and there is a reward attached to it. Because we are on the Ethereum blockchain, those rewards are um, ETH or any um, token on the Ethereum blockchain. And the smart contract that underlies that bounty is a very, very simple and flexible format that we have been using for a lot of different um, applications um, like rewarding engagement, community um, uh, building within different regions, within different, different geographies. And we have started looking and working with not just crypto projects, but also companies and uh, entities outside of uh, the crypto space, who I like to call crypto curious, who are looking at blockchain um, as a real, real uh, means of, of impacting change. And one example is uh, a project that we did in the Philippines. We incentivized a cleanup um, for a uh, beach in Manila Bay with a fisherman community. Um, we had 224 people turn up cleaned up 3.3 tons of trash and rewarded all of the participants with cryptocurrency. We onboarded them onto Web3 wallets and I wanted to show you a quick video. video. It's very, very quick. It's a minute, but it will give you an idea of what we did. The trash issue really is impacting people's lives. Garbage everywhere. Pupunta dito ang tao para mangisda. Pag-uwi, wala rin na mamakuha dahil sa dahil. Lahat ng basura na pupunta sa dagat ang kalat. 
What happens when a traditional job like fishing stops being sustainable? You need to create new means of income. You need to create alternatives. Incentives are behavior changing. If you're able to channel that, you're going to be able to mobilize a lot of people. Ang ginagawa namin is para is hindi para sa amin, hindi para sa next future or generation. We saw that monetary incentives were a great way to get people on the ground, but now that they're here, they actually can look past those incentives and really feel the intrinsic motivation. <laughs> Really impressive video that touches all the and I can share the so. full video with everyone again that's only 13 minutes but it's it's effects are thank you so point. much Ariane yeah. yes uh, good afternoon and thank you for inviting me so my name is Ariane and I represent the European Economic and Social Committee and that committee is a EU treaty based consultative body to uh, give advice to the Commission and the Parliament and the Council. And um, the, the committee, the European Economic and Social Committee, gathers representatives from organized civil society across all member states of the European Union. We are appointed by our governments and we represent interests very broadly from employers, or business interests, to trade unions and various interest groups. And as president for the section for single market production and consumption, we have uh, recently published two opinions, that's the main instruments we use, um, to share our ideas on blockchain. The first one was a request from 11 ministers across Europe to draft on blockchain and social economy enterprise. Is there a link between the cooperative business model and blockchain? And the second one that was just uh, adopted in October was on blockchain and the single market. So I'm really here to share some ideas on policy work that can be done. Thank you so much, really interesting for the discussion. Graham? Okay, buenas tardes. Um, so, my name is Graham Douglas, um, and uh, I think it's relevant to point out that I did uh, uh, urban planning and uh, architecture as a degree, and I've been in the social housing space for 25 years, as well as being in IT uh, for most of my career. So, my current role in IT is that I spent seven years in the United States running a North American team across all applications, including blockchain and IoT. And now I'm here, actually based in Malaga. Um, and I'm the, the hub leader for 700 people here based in Malaga who are also employed here, but 26 different nationalities, but they're citizens of this city. And, uh, we have multifaceted uh, engagement with blockchain and other technologies, and I'm here to talk about that. Thank you so much. I think we have another video here. Uh, yeah, we have a video, just a quick uh, video from Volvo of something that we did with Volvo. Play video. so much another interesting use case that we heard about this morning and would we'll dig deeper into during this discussion I left you this slide with our uh, with the the tweet Twitter addresses for the speakers if you want to use them comment what we are talking about you're very welcome okay now so let's dig into the questions for this round table uh, first I would ask to uh, like 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 to ask all of you uh, in this order how can distributed Ledger technologies strengthen the existing infrastructure for real-world economic sustainability changes. Then. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of existing models, uh, three big things that blockchain is unlocking. The first is tokenization. So earlier asset classes that used to be too big, uh, at least in economies like ours, like if it's land uh, as a parcel, it's too expensive. 
uh, but as a tokenized asset, shareable asset, it can be made more affordable. Um, then to after tokenization, it's decentralization, right? So at the moment, uh, in economies like ours, there are many intermediaries, right, for services. And that's what takes up uh, delays services. It sort of um, slows down the efficiency of the economic gain that comes to the last mile. Um, disintermediation is a very big uh, gain from blockchain. And the third is the peer-to-peer -peer network. Right? So with existing um, goods and services, if we can move to peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange, uh, that is a huge gain. Yeah. Thank you, Tanvi. Simona? So I think even based on, on the example that I just shared, it, it's very much about inclusivity and, and enabling people to access resources, whether those resources are information, whether they are um, monetary resources, whether they are a global pool of work. Right now, there are swathes of population um, all over the world who are just not tapped into the system. And Stefan and I were chatting about this earlier. We have somebody in our community, for instance, who um, is homeless in Phoenix, Arizona, so not even where when we think, oh, people aren't included, it happens everywhere. Um, and he uses bounties to earn crypto to make a living. And then he cashes out at crypto ATMs in Phoenix. He doesn't have a bank account because he doesn't have an address. So looking at these methods of enabling that access is incredibly, incredibly powerful, and we're already seeing it happening. The more we collaborate, the more we get these pilots, these activations out there, the quicker this inclusion uh, is going to manifest itself. Thank you, Simona. Ariane, I think this question fits you very well, so yeah. please feel free to develop a little more in this one. Um, so in the work we did on these opinions I mentioned in my introduction, uh, we really looked at the opportunities of, um, and challenges of blockchain from a single market perspective. But of course it's set in, in a bigger landscape of what we're going through in society right now. So we all know that we're going through extremely complex societal challenges and the only way to meet them or tackle them is to join forces and mobilize all resources in society. And what I mean by these, of course, we know then digital trans transition, climate transition, but also the loss of democracy in, in several member states and, and across the globe, and of course trust. And then if we look at the inherent values of blockchain, there's a lot of important values that can actually promote to rebuild some of the cohesion in society. So I think that's really the true opportunity is the technology behind and how it can be applied across sectors and then to really put forward some of the key values that we're looking at. When it comes to sustainability, I know that United Nations did a white paper looking at the SDGs and blockchain. And I think they looked at 15 projects and could see a very strong link we have a lot of ideas and learning. I think what we need now is really action to make this happen. So it's taking it to the next step and how can we really use some of these good examples and multiply them uh, across sectors and opportunities. So I do believe that this is uh, really the way that what we could see in our work is that uh, blockchain can reinvent uh, the social economic models of many communities. Really interesting. See, yes, thank you. Graham? Oh, okay, so I will echo what the other panelists have said, but I think the last word you said was action. And from our perspective, um, although we're a commercial entity, we often learn a lot from you know, the enterprise government level and how we can actually take that from a global perspective and bring that right into the local citizen perspective. And in each of the things that you said, we're looking at projects that are either an outreach project where we're using the technology as an enabler to bring people, even, even in this city right now, we have a project where we're trying to bring women over 40 back into the workplace by recognizing the talent and the skills that they have, but also transferring that into a system of credits that can then get them back into the workplace. That sustainability, for me, starts local, right? But we have a huge advantage in companies like us because we don't just see it at the local city level, we see it at this global level. We have something like 420,000 customers. So it gives us, at the heart of all of this, data. Yeah. And that's a key strength in the whole blockchain process. Yeah. And you're talking about 10 million blockchain people in, in India. That's just a phenomenal uh, group to manage. But 
that's the kind of problems we're trying to tackle and translate into a local action. Thank you so much. We can see a red line here from the most basic uh, single user to those 10 million, it was just my reflection. Next question I would like to ask you is how can DLT or digital alleged or distributed ledger technologies have a meaningful social impact within developing the transition, uh, transitioning countries, for example, by uh, guaranteeing food safety and supply chain transparency? I think actually that was the next question. I'm so sorry. The, this is the second one. How can smart cities address sustainability issues and cultivate new business models and opportunities for local entrepreneurs? Yeah, so Smart City actually is a huge initiative in India. The Prime Minister launched 100 Smart Cities uh, in the last term, uh, and that is only increasing now. And um, for, for a place like India, where, you know, it's one of the fastest growing economies, you have uh, the cheapest mobile data, very f uh, deep mobile penetration, uh, but also the digital infrastructure is still sort of keeping up. Right? Like, I mean, just getting internet, getting optical fiber everywhere, uh, you know, even that, that level, it, it has been challenging, though they have done a relatively good job of it. So I think for, in, for a context like India, Smart City gives you the digital infrastructure to really enter the digital age, to have a, a society included in a digital economy in Industry 4.0. It's the basis. Thank you. Simona? And I think um, very much following on from that, it is, again, and I reiterate this, it is about the individuals and empowering the individuals within their own, within their local communities to be able to create the solutions that their communities are in need of. And what Graham said earlier, yes, Oracle is great, and you, you are able to do these things, but actually I would say that the change here really is that the individuals who now feel empowered to create solutions for, for their own communities. Case in point, um, we had somebody at um, DEFCON. DEFCON is the biggest um, event in the Ethereum calendar in terms of uh, gatherings and, and sharing um, ideas. And we had a cohort of scholars who were coming from over 25 different countries, including Syria and Afghanistan. Now, the points of view and the insights that somebody who is living in Syria can give you in terms of what the solutions need to be is incredibly different to what I would think, let's say, sitting in the US or Western Europe, um, my assumptions of what they would need. And being able to empower people like um, Shakti to be able to build something himself or with the help of his local community, that is is the big, big yeah. change in smart cities because absolutely um, help move that along. What, I, I really like what Simona said. It's about empowerment. I think there's so many examples of connectivity when it comes to blockchain, so I don't think I need to repeat them. But um, going back to what I said uh, first about the societal channel, just uh, one way we know that we can resolve this is about social innovation. And social innovation, it, it all happens at local level. We know that. Um, we all live at local level, so it's, it's natural. But social innovation is really um, the way to, to look at bringing together stakeholders and where civil society often is a catalyst. So if you look at many of the welfare systems across the world, they were built based on initiatives by charities or civil society organizations. So that stakeholder needs to be involved in this discussion is what I'm trying to say. And this is also a very important channel to reach engaged citizens. Um, so that's one point that I think uh, to create this enabling environment for civil society, but it's also uh, about diverse forms of enterprise. So we know that we have all different kinds of business models, but unfortunately a lot of the legislation and policy is based on a mainstream traditional business. So in the scope of blockchain and digital technologies, new businesses are emerging. And it's anything from circular to collaborative economy to the old phenomena of social enterprise that I work a lot with. But we need to make sure that we have action plans and we have support plans that fits, fits these models as well. And my final point on this is also looking at, um, the keynote said 99% uh, of businesses in Canada are small, medium enterprises. It's the same in Europe. 
99% and the backbone of the European economy are SMEs. So they also need to have the chance to be empowered to act at this local level, to form these innovative partnerships we need to tackle these gaps in society, so come up with good solutions that fit that local context. Okay, so that's, uh, again, three great points. Um, I'll start with the last thing you said there. I actually believe that in a lot of ways, um, technology started to democratize things in a phenomenal way already, regardless of just blockchain access to information, whether you're an individual, small business, or even enterprise. With regards to smart cities, um, from, from our perspective, we're still, uh, we're still developing out that strategy. We don't have a holistic over, overriding view. We are strong in aspects of it. I would challenge anyone who's really got a full picture of how to bring it all together. We might be strong on retail, finance, and other elements of it, um, but it requires government agencies, non-government agencies. It, it, you, to get the smart, uh, the smart sustainable city to work, uh, you need a bigger collaborative environment. Um, I want to fall back on one thing in my experience. I've been um, involved in a charity uh, uh, focused on Africa, microfinance. And one of the things I see for blockchain that is super interesting for about 15 years, we've been doing microfinance in, in, in Africa. And we often talk about the last mile. Part of the problem is the first mile. <laughs> because the person who's actually making the product doesn't understand the whole supply chain and the other person is receiving the least amount of money. And we're now working with obviously companies or, or individuals in, in, in the African continent and everywhere else, but we're actually doing it at an enterprise level coming the other way with companies like Tony's Chocoloni, which is a Dutch ethical chocolate manufacturer. They buy their chocolate from um, uh, the Ivory Coast, but they authenticate and track and trace where and who they buy it from. These are the steps in the right way to make everyone a participant and making sure the right people get the money. Definitely. And now the third question that I jumped on too early. How can digital ledger technologies or distributed ledger technologies have a meaningful social impact within developing and transitioning countries, for example, by guaranteeing food safety and supply chain transparency? Tanvi? I think this is one that you know, I would like to explore a little bit. So if you take, um, for example, with this backbone that we're trying to build, right? Take the problem of agricultural supply chains. Um, and most of India's economy, for example, is uh, engaged in agriculture. Um, so the situation is such that um, after a farmer harvests his crop, there is, uh, it's a, a time-bound thing. You know, he's sitting on a perishable item. He has to get it into what is called spot markets. We have these agricultural spot markets where prices are sort of uh, fixed, so traders don't uh, scam these farmers. There are price uh, floors, uh, you know, at which price the crop gets procured. So for this farmer to now get to the spot market is not an easy process. Many times those are like 200 kilometers away. Uh, the farmer has to somewhere get a truck uh, and it costs him, you know, maybe 10 days wages, maybe a month's wages sometimes just to get to the market. And now when he gets to the market, there are all these intermediaries there who examine his crop um, and they validate whether it meets the standard and then they're supposed to pay him a specified price. And that's where a lot of corruption also happens. So they might validate him not up to the standard of his project, uh, product, but like three standards lower, you know, just so they pay him a lesser wage. And because this man has given up a day's wage, 10 days wage to get to this market, he just does a distress sale. You know, he just has to sell at whatever price he's getting, it doesn't matter how much effort he put into that sowing season, into getting this crop up. Um, he is somewhere at the mercy of the intermediary. He is um, not able to prove the authenticity of his produce. Um, it's so difficult at such a huge geographical scale to build robust uh, supply chains. Like You can't put so much manpower into it. And so move that to a blockchain uh, scenario, you know, 
Uh, it's, it'll be transformational, the level yeah. to which it can, de if you can decentralize these spot markets, if you can move to models of, let's say, community verification, right? So I don't need one officer verifying the authenticity of produce. I can have a com local community set of villages, you know, I can incentivize people to say the truth because I think the biggest um, power is that you can set incentives in a blockchain that you can't do in a traditional economy. Uh, in the traditional economy, when I have incentives, they're through subsidies or through, uh, it's a very bureaucratic process of uh, setting those incentives and it's so easy in a blockchain you just uh, get an authorization, uh, whether if it's through a government treasury, you get some authorization and it's a code, you know. Um, it's transformational, like we can't even begin to imagine just how much will get unlocked uh, yeah. at the bottom of the permit. Yeah, really transformative use case and very tangible also. Yes. Yeah. Simona? I mean, that's the perfect segue for me with incentives. Thank you. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, we did, we did. Um, but like um, we just said, Tamvi, you know, hit the nail on the head. Incentives can be incredibly, incredibly powerful, particularly when you are trying to change a certain way of doing things, certain systems that are clearly flawed. So two examples that I wanted to give you. Um, one is a project that we're potentially working on in the Bahamas where they have a huge problem with trash as we saw in the Philippines, there are a lot of countries that have huge problems with trash. But um, in the Bahamas, um, they are looking at using incentives to get people to recycle. So get the citizens of the Bahamas to recycle and deliver these micro incentives so that they continue doing it to the point where you are creating lasting behavioral change. And as a result, being able to, you know, ensure the environmental health of your country and then your community benefits, then you as an individual benefit. And it is that ability to trace everything, to track everything, where you or whomever contributes to these initiatives can see exactly where the money goes. The cleanup that I showed in the Philippines, we crowdsource the funds for that. And the reason why it was an incredibly powerful piece is because anybody could contribute. Some people were contributing $5 worth of ETH, others 10, others 300. But it was one button with one transaction that confirmed that money and everybody who contributed knew exactly where the money was going to the people who were submitting verifiable proof of a cleanup. And that is huge, because right now, dispersing funds on an international level is completely opaque. You don't really see much. It goes from here to here to here to here, never mind how expensive it is. So again, incredibly, incredibly powerful and um, exciting. Yeah, a way to join the crypto economy and uh, right. yeah, with the incentives. Yes, uh, I'd like to kind of stay on the context of social impact because this, has, this is important. And it is also about starting to measure social impact in parallel to other forms of progress and measuring progress of society. So, so that's a key point. And this is a way um, to really push that forward. I also think that when it comes to um, pick up a blockchain um, across services, I think uh, let's also explore a little bit about public services and the public sector. So when we have, um, you know, transforming societies, as I said before, and I think truly that applying blockchain technology to public services uh, is a way to increase, we know, trust and transparency, but it's also a way to track things. And when we look at um, consumer protection, for instance, uh, we have a high standard in the EU for consumer protection, and there's a great opportunity to ensure trust and and. and you know, this cooperation between the business sector and, and consumers and that trust building exercise is important. So there's a lot there, but I think we have to discuss how we measure the impact. And this is generally uh, for societies. Okay, so I, th I think um, my response to it would be we're living in a great opportunity and a great time because we have on one side, uh, uh, the citizen individual who's a consumer who's becoming more ethical in their choice 
and then we have people in the supply chain who have the raw material, who are providing it, and now blockchain can help with other technologies to identify how that goes from here to here. And if you look at the example on the video that we had there with Volvo, Volvo, you know, it's not just about Volvo, it's about the whole electric car and lithium-ion battery going forward. It relies on cobalt, and cobalt, 95% of it is coming from Congo. And a lot of it is mined and used with child labor. And that part of the process is, is being taken out, not just by blockchain track and trace, but other technology enhancing that too. Uh, it takes a consortium of ideas to make it work. Um, but that does something good for the environment, does something good for trade, it does good, something good for humanity. It's multifaceted, the benefit you get there. But you asked about food, Stefan. I mean, part of the food thing is, I can look at it as being um, honey, authenticating how honey is. We're working uh, to, to make sure that the honey is not just uh, added with fructose that's uh, man-made, that it's really authenticated where it came from and where it went and who consumes it. We're doing it with uh, Italian uh, virgin oil. If, if you're a, a producer of that, how can you make sure that that's the real product that you're actually marketing and that the counterfeit option isn't uh, corrupted and the money's not going into the right hands? So we're, 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 we're looking at it everywhere. And in terms of response, you know, one of the things I like about it, I come from the UK as my introduction. Um, I remember, uh, or some of you might remember many years ago, mad cow disease, right? <laughs> and in the UK, they just shut beef exports. That was it. Right now, if you look at blockchain, one of the things that blockchain can do with uh, track in, uh, intelligent track and trace or cold trace is it can look at where did it start very quickly and it can isolate it and therefore it can protect everybody else within a marketplace and individual uh, producers. So you don't shut down a whole industry, you don't shut down a whole community, and you don't shut down a whole country. And I think that kind of transparency is going to be good in all civilizations, West and transforming societies, because the trust is at the heart of the process and the technology is enabling that trust. Yeah. And like a last question, we touched upon it, like the differences between different countries and regions and so on. Uh, I think it would be very interesting in th to, to hear what you think are the biggest challenges, for example, for India, if you wouldn't like to touch upon where, what you, the projects you have done in the, in the Oceanian, and we can listen to Europe and, and other areas also. Like short, what's, what's your, what's, what are the main challenges in this sense for sustainability? You mean in the blockchain context? Yeah, yeah. I, I think from blockchain, what we can do with blockchain and what you have seen and what should be done with yeah. blockchain because there's so many things to do, but specifically where blockchain can play a, a key role yeah, so uh, I mean, definitely in supply chains, as we discussed, there is a huge advantage. I think one that is not discussed enough is, uh, I think, in gender balance, right? Um, if you take uh, these reputation tokens, you know, they're finally creating a way to monetize social capital. Um, and for like societies like ours, it's a challenge because there is no economic valuation of social capital in the world. And, you know, uh, economists are also looking into the way GDP is measured. And uh, there's no way to incentivize uh, social bondedness or connectedness or support structures in an economy. And when it comes to valuing the role of women, which is something we were talking about in the earlier panel, uh, these are a huge uh, instrument, the reputation yeah. uh, token. And I think, but the biggest challenge in rolling out anything, I think, to be honest, like there are still, of course, challenges on the technological side, but the technology is probably the easiest part. You know, the biggest uh, difficulty is first at the level of procedures and processes and uh, existing systems to move those is very difficult. Uh, then to educate everybody is also difficult. But I think the biggest uh, shift is in uh, mindsets. You know, it's, it's very difficult because there is um, so many uh, centuries of like 
cultural, uh, you know, there, there's a way to work, there is a way to uh, right. uh, function in society. So when you're changing that, it's a challenge. But the advantage for a country like ours uh, is India is the youngest country in the world, right? It's 50% uh, of the population is under 25 years of age. Um, and they're all digital natives, uh, you know, very uh, boundary pushing in their attitudes. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. And just um, one reminder, you can ask questions on Slido, so make sure to ask your questions, vote for the best questions for the for the speakers? Um, so for me, it's very much, and again, um, following on something that Tanvi said, it is about that education piece. So because we were talking about empowering individuals and empowering communities, um, the education piece is something that we have been working on consistently for the past 18 months. And it is going and making material available, not in overly complicated terms, translated in local languages, and again, using incentives to keep certain populations engaged enough to get to a point where they can then start building their own solutions, they can then start looking at how to, to access funds and so on. So, um, just briefly, this um, we're doing a, a pilot in Brazil, in the favelas, where we're working with youth in the favelas, getting them onboarded onto Web3 wallets, like we did for the fishermen, it's actually not difficult at all. And the more we do that, the more people realize it is actually something that's very, very simple, very doable. And the more you learn by doing, the more those ideas start, start sparking. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. Well, if I go back to the work that the European Economic and Social Committee did and the opinions, uh, we give policy recommendations and recommendations on legislation so forth to the European institutions. So, uh, what we call for is that we want um, an action plan, like a policy initiative now with the new commission and parliament in office for the next five years to really focus on the opportunities with blockchain technology. And what we mean by this is that we uh, want to make sure that there's an enabling environment created for all forms of businesses, SMEs and diverse forms of businesses, so make sure that we can, can have that opportunity. But it's also about educating, and it's also about um, building capacity in communities. So it needs to have really concrete um, policy initiatives. But in addition, I, what we've seen is that we need... Um, more clarity and certainty when it comes to legislation. So we have to look at the tension between, potentially tension between GDPR and blockchain. Um, also we need to look at uh, standards and how they should be uh, developed or applied. And for that we ask for also a much broader blockchain stakeholder forum. And we, we're looking for a, a platform. The committee is currently running one on circular economy together with the European Commission because we need to involve more stakeholders. The only way that it can be mainstreamed and streamlined is that civil society is involved, the, the EU institutions are involved, and all the different stakeholders. So we're calling for much broader, open, accessible, and free of charge opportunity to engage. Thank you very much. I think actually we have a question from the audience. Is that, I'm sorry, Graham, and I was, okay. she was waving to me. It's five minutes. So we listen what you have to ask and we see if you can... Yeah, I was going to say, Stefan, in transparency, uh, there's no Slido questions at the moment that I can see. So I was going to suggest, let's do it the old-fashioned way. Um, unless you'd like to go, of course, to Graham, uh, you have three minutes left. Or would you like to ask the audience if they've got a question? And we can hand round a microphone. So, Mr. Moderator, it's your show. I won't even take more than 10 seconds. 10 because seconds. Because what... what everyone said I agree with already. Um, I would just say it's point of access, it's ease of use, and it's open source. Yeah. That's, that's the, the challenges for blockchain going forward. Is there any question in the audience? I can't really see very well. You just wave. Yeah, there's a question up there. Is it possible to... A short question, specific one, and we try to answer it before the last comment. Thanks. Uh, my question is, uh, what about the dark side of blockchain? For example, the electricity consumption, or, I mean, informatic resources. Uh, maybe not, not all the countries in the world have those uh, resources now. You want to take it? Sure. No. Um, yeah. Um, I think 
number one, every technology, when it gets going, there's a whole bunch of problems that we still need to, to wire in out and to solve. That, the energy one, is an ongoing one. Um, and it is definitely an important one because I always get questions, yes, you're doing all of this great work, but also there is the energy consumption, and I totally get it. But I would say, let us not let that slow us down in terms of experimenting and finding out where what it applies to and what it doesn't, whilst we are working to solve those problems. Yeah. I think it can happen in tandem. Definitely. Like a fin final comment, and we have a one-liner from each one of the speakers also, but I would just like to make a conclusion. I think we have found in this table that blockchain is relevant for all aspects on sustainability. We've seen an example of economy, economy, social, environmental. And uh, blockchain is all relevant from solutions from the individual to the highest level of governance. So I think that's like con the, the, the sphere is so big and it's so much to do. And from the discussion, I would like to ask you to give just a one-liner each, a takeaway for the audience from your experience. One each, if you want. Feel welcome. So for me, blockchain is all about um, creating opportunity and choice. And I think we should be experimenting with what those opportunities and choices are across all verticals, uh, across all geographies. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? Um, as I said, we are calling for a European Union policy initiative and that should also include an EU blockchain stakeholder platform, including more stakeholders in the development. And just a little um, reply to your question, there are actually initiatives already looking at energy saving, in, the, in particular in Slovenia, I think, so there are some good initiatives that can be applied. Thank you. Um, I think in one liner, liner, I think blockchain is uh, an enabler of new paradigms and it's an enabler to step into a whole new world, pretty much. Very yeah. Disney-ish, but yes. Oh, great. <laughs> Graham, I like work. the new world concept, but um, look, blockchain in itself is not a panacea. Blockchain has to integrate with other technology. I said it in my previous comment that it has to be open. It has to be mobile. It has to be able to go into existing infrastructure, but it also has to anticipate future application and future infrastructure without prejudice. And right now, for blockchain, I think that's the next step of its evolution and how it grows up in the, at least in the commercial sense and at the, the high government arena. Thank you so much. Thank you to the audience for listening to, to us. Thank for the organization for the possibility to moderate this Thank super so interesting much. and fantastic round table. And uh, an applause. Oh, I was not supposed to say that. It's that was fine. your A word. Thank applause. you so much. A round of applause for so expertly moderating the panel and the time, Stefan. Thank you Thank ever you so, so much. much. And if everybody would like to leave in that direction, that's uh, fantastic. Um, so, lots of sustainability projects there, and they mentioned it there in that panel about how do we measure the social impact. And that's what the last panel discussion is about, techniques for measuring social impact. It's going to be moderated by Jörg Walden. He's the founder and CEO of iPoint Systems, which develops tools and services for environmental and product compliance and sustainability. And he tells me his vision is to build an integrated digital platform for the circular economy. So if you'd like to use Slido, please do. But Jörg, the floor is all yours. Hello, everyone. I am not Jörg, I am Maike Gericke of the Board of uh, Directors of Enatpa, so we have a little bit of a change in the moderation of the panel. But uh, therefore I can introduce the first panelist, which is Jörg Walden, <laughs> who has already been introduced. Um, he is the founder and CEO of iPoint Systems. We have here Caroline Damas uh, of Grassroots Economics. Um, Vanessa Grelay of uh, Consensus, Executive Director, among other things, and Julian Zirker of Proof of Impact. 
Um, so the topic of our panel is the future of sustainability techniques for measuring social impact. And to start that off, um, I would like to ask everyone uh, just a quick one sentence questions. Why should or why shouldn't we measure the social impact of our initiatives? Let's start with, start with Jörg. Yeah, um, if we don't measure it, we cannot improve it. So the question is to make it visible and comparable. I think we have to find a common agreement and the metrics where we really understand what are we buying, where are we buying it, how is it computed, how is it calculated, and all the other things around. Otherwise, we have no chance to make it better in the future. Um, we should measure social impact because at the end of it, our end goal is to make things better for the community we serve. And if we can't measure it, then how can we improve? How can we get better? And so it's very, very important to be able to do that. Uh, I'll take a little counter argument. I think we should measure it, but we have gotten so far into the semantics of measuring it and the details of measuring, that, of measuring it that sometimes we lose sight of the original intent. If your original intent in your investment or your activity is to reduce carbon footprint, yes, you're going to have to uh, measure it, but you're not going to have to fight with other people on exactly what you're measuring, how you're measuring it, if it's comparable, etc., because then you're just going to waste time and take it outside of your focus of your, your key initiative. I think we should uh, measure impact because it has intrinsic value. And in, in that sense, it's probably the most undervalued asset class right now. And I'm among those people who wants to capitalize on this. Okay, so I think that's a very good introduction into, into the topic. I think we also touched upon the need of having measurement around social impact in the last panel, and there was some great discussion around it. But Apart from having a conceptual discussion around impact, what I would like to do is to have it a bit more tangible. And we have a lot of experts here on stage that are working with real-life projects and um, that are actually spending their days in uh, the measurement and in the execution of, of, of impact initiatives. So um, I would like to go a bit into the tangible examples of your work, uh, starting uh, to my right with Caroline. Um, what is it, can you give us some examples of your work with, uh, with Crossroads Economics and the impact that it makes on financial inclusion? Thank you, Mike. So, um, Grassroots Economics for the past uh, almost nine years, since 2010, we've worked with the rural communities and peri-urban communities to be able to empower them economically in a way to bring financial inclusion to them. And our model has been to use community currencies. The question is, when we talk about financial inclusion, most people think about money. And what if you go to a community that doesn't even have the money? What do you do for them? How can you make sure that they are still able to meet their basic needs? That they are able to survive? They are able to make savings when they don't even have money? They don't have liquidity? So that was the question for us. And uh, the the best way we could think about it was to introduce a community currency uh, model for them. And it was amazing because it helped to spur trade in the community. And it's not so much about the economic aspects of it, it's also about the social aspects of it. There's something really empowering about making people to meet their basic needs. There's something empowering about not going into debt to be able to buy water, to buy food on a daily basis, to be able to have three square meals a day, and for you to introduce a tool in the community that ensures that they're able to meet those needs, make savings in a reliable way, it's really good. And for us to be able to transform it, because we started with paper vouchers, and the communities could trade, almost like a promissory note, a formalized better trade system, and the question is, how can we make it better? And the solution came in the form of blockchain, and we're able to make those um, currencies digital. And it's amazing because for blockchain, it comes with all these characteristics, and it's not just for us, even in terms of the community, and how they can measure impact, and how they can be able to do resource mobilization 
to be able to go to government agencies, local authorities and say, look, this is my community and they are spending so much of their community currencies to access water that's not available in the community. What can you do for us? And for them to be able to ask for those resources and to see government come in and other non-state actors to be able to improve that. I think that for us was really good. That's a wonderful example of impact. Let's go uh, to Vanessa on my left. Um, you have so many experiences to draw from that it's probably quite hard to choose one of them, but I would like you to go into one example of one of your favorite projects and the impact that it Yeah, so I just want to take a step back before I do that and um, share what it means for us as a technology company uh, to drive impact. So uh, at Consensus, I have a role as an executive director where we create products, we serve clients and governments to help them create projects, but we also have an education arm. And then uh, with my other hat as the president of the Blockchain for Social Impact Coalition, we try to bring everyone together um, to create uh, more solutions, reduce the cost of adoption of the technology. So in our uh, mindset, there is this aspect of adoption, getting more people to use the technology, educate people, create products, and empower entrepreneurs. And so throughout this whole journey, this is how we consider we create the impact for, uh, for all those projects by supporting all of them. In terms of specific, uh, we created a product um, called Impaxio, uh, which is actually trying to help uh, people through blockchain technology and incentive-based mechanisms to allocate better their resources to impact projects. So we uh, created this with the World Wildlife Fund, um, who wanted a, a collective of curators to determine and help people create better projects. So that's one of the examples that we have that is blockchain-based. Thank you very much. Very interesting. We're going back to my other side, uh, Jörg. <laughs> um, you're working uh, a lot, lot, lot on circular economy and on the frameworks of indicators um, around that. Can you share a bit of an example and a deep dive into what do they mean in practice and what are the, the measures and factors that you're working on on a daily basis? Yeah, sure, sure. I think... Um if you're talking about circular economy and if you're talking about, I don't know, a world with limited resources and unlimited ideas, how do we connect these two approaches together? And I think it's clear that on the long term we cannot move on like we're doing at the moment. And specifically the Generation Z is heavily looking into the impacts um, from the product they're buying. So how can we transform then the linear economy system into this circular economy system? thinking about the boundaries of the materials, what we are using in the product, where are we buying them from, how much recycled materials are we consuming on the one side, but also something like small, uh, smart, so what is the digitalization, smart devices, and all the other information we get from the lifetime of the product, what information do we have, how can we build better product in the future in the design, so how can we attach all these different data packages through the supply chain to the designer where we can make the right decision. Carbon footprint, what material I'm selecting, what is the impact if I'm selecting A to B. Today, designers are making more or less a decision on physical properties. They are really not interested about carbon footprint generation, multi-generation materials, recycled materials and all the other information we have. So how can we change the thinking and the mindset in the design and how can we bring this information to the consumers? These are the indicators we're trying to catch and trying to present to the right persons. Yeah? Like material improvement, energy consumption, so through the total supply chain. So every product itself should have a footprint. How can you create a specific footprint for this car, with this roof, with this whatever combination you have by it? And how can you show the improvement you can generate over the different channels, if you would use different kinds of materials, different kinds of production, and impacts to where you're buying and your resources from. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So, now again to my left, Julian, uh, you basically dedicated an entire project uh, on proof of impact, so you can tell us maybe a little bit more about how that works, and maybe you want to talk about waste management or some other example. Oh, so. I mean, I spend my whole life trying to, to deliver impact in one way or another. And uh, 
my current venture called Proof of Impact is just the latest uh, on this journey. And we've just recently closed our first institutional round of funding, so we're venture-backed. Uh, we have a, a large institutional lead investor. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to build impact investment products that are underwritten by actual impact. So we verify impact events as they happen, and we tokenize them, we treat them as unique kind of events, and then we build financial products on top of that. We use them as collateral for financial pro and we think that we, we are entering a market that is in the you know, two trillion dollar amount. Um, our, mo our simplest products actually a donation. So right now you can pay one dollar for one pound of trash taken out of the ocean. Um, and in exchange for your dollar, you get unique proof points that that, that that trash was actually removed, where it was removed, there's a geotag, there's a timestamp, there's a picture of, the, there's a picture of the, the receipt from the recycler. And we have more than 30 different types of events that are quite similar. So you can put some money on a concrete, unique event, and you get proof points and full attribution for that event. And it's a, you know, the, the ocean one's quite interesting because it's, it, started almost, it started as a small experiment. We never thought it would go to scale. And now it's our most successful product um, because it's really easy. I mean, people care about the ocean, people care about plastic in the ocean. And we always say that it's the next best thing to actually standing up from where you're sitting, going to the beach and taking one pound of ocean, uh, of trash out of the ocean. The next best thing is you can pay someone to do that. And the communities that we're paying are communities that have low income opportunities anyway. And we're creating, we're creating a sustainable business opportunity for them. Okay, thank you very much. So I think we've seen now some great examples of, of uh, the practical applications of, uh, of impact measurement. Now I think all of you are working in this space already for quite a long time and also before blockchain uh, came along. Some of you are also working for quite a long time in blockchain already. Um, where do you see the specific advantages of using blockchain technology or DRT technology in the examples that you just highlighted around traceability um, in the supply chain, in investment. Can you, can you expand on that? Whoever wants to go first. I guess so. Um, if you see uh, different industries and verticals in the market, um, you have different advantages for the different kind of industries. Typically, for example, automotive industry, there's a huge hierarchical system. Yeah? This means you have a couple of OEMs, they put a lot of pressure in the supply chain to get the data, and they get more or less the data they need. So it's not so complex for them. The biggest question to get full declaration, to get full data for most companies in this area is intellectual property. How can you secure that my data, what I'm giving to you, is my intellectual property, is my advantage of the, of the business and changeability, so transparency on the one side, but how can somebody change the data, immutability of data, how can this help the technology in the future to, to give the persons the right data to the right time and nobody can adjust it, specifically in compliance, for example, it's quite important that you cannot cheat anymore because the data is not changeable anymore, that the transparency is generated over intellectual property and security rights at the end. And I think this is one of the advantages where, where blockchain really can help immutability, microtransactions, payment for data, data-driven business models. And this is where we hope that we can heavily increase the, the performance of getting more information to the product and make it more transparent at the end. I think uh, for our case, um the whole aim of community currencies and them being complementary in nature is the whole idea that in a community it can meet and met needs with underutilized resources. And uh, sometimes it's hard for the community to move around, especially in a large area. But when you use blockchain and you have all that data, and it's amazing for a community to be able to go to a resource center and be able to see, I have this need, and here is someone that can offer this particular need that I want, or I have all these resources, but 
they are, there aren't people in my need, immediate neighborhood that require them, but I can get them in the larger community. And it's a really good tool for blockchain to be able to have all that out there for the community to see. Apart from that, I like the whole idea of traceability, for them to be able to trace transactions, especially in terms of resource mobilization, not only within the community, but also for outside donors. They want to see we've given these resources, especially government, and they've been used for this particular purpose. And you can see that with the community currency because they work within a particular community. And you can see it went to this community, it went to this particular individual. There's a huge concern of gender and are women getting access to the funds that they want. But because of um, this community currency that's a token, and it's on someone's phone, and she's a woman, and she was able to receive her tokens, and she was able to go to the local uh, water point, and she was able to access water, or she was able to go to the community agroforestry plot, and she was able to buy organic vegetables, and you can trust that. I think that's a really good thing. So for me, it's traceability and the ability to open up the possibilities for the communities, and also, it's about really the whole idea of building the community vis-a-vis -vis of building people outside. Most of the time when you do financing to communities or we give them aid, it tends to trickle out. And so people come in the moment you give the aid and you have these big businesses that come in and sell and the community just buys. But this currency just circulates within the community. And it's amazing to be able to see on the blockchain that how is it taking place. And in terms of also reading the community needs, are they spending so much money on water? Are they spending much, much money on uh, farm needs? What does that tell us? How can the data talk to us? And what other partners can we bring in to be able to add value to the community? So that is really amazing. And the fact that we are able to do all that without the internet. So being able to bring blockchain to a rural community that does not use the internet, but it can really work on a feature phone because we should help communities but in a way that doesn't disillusion them, that doesn't tell them they have to be techies and understand what blockchain is. This is a solution for them, it's working for them, and it's working in a way that is for them and in a very simple way. So for me, it's four, four components. Trust, transparency, reducing friction, and uh, reducing settlement time. And all these together uh, allow us to transact as individuals, as humans, as machines, as we also transact with machines, in a much uh, more equal uh, way and allows to create a, a level playing field. And uh, what I mean by reducing costs, um, the settlement is instantaneous. I can send value everywhere across the world instantaneously. I can uh, get rid of the middleman, which takes cost into this transaction. I can um, trust uh, the person without knowing them personally. Why did we do business before in you know, such local or very uh, you know, clubby way? It's because you needed to see the person, to touch the person. You don't need to do that to trust someone over the blockchain or trust that you're going to receive a, a payment. And then transparency, the fact that you're able to track uh, in a transparent way, uh, whether it's permission or not, uh, the information, including the donations, and also to track the impact of the donations or the transfer of value is something that is achievable with the blockchain. Um, there's a project called Alice, um, one of the co-founders is going to speak tomorrow, um, that allows you to really uh, track from the point of uh, donation to the point of usage and to measure the impact of of what you're, um, what you're allocating your resources to. So, proof of impact, uh, first principles, blockchain company, but nowhere in our narrative do you find the word blockchain. Uh, and that's because I think that if we are willing to get out of our echo chamber as a blockchain community and go out there, we realize that people don't actually care about blockchain. If blockchain, blockchain is just that magic that makes something happen that otherwise wouldn't have happened. That's how I, I look at it. And for us, it's blockchain is the best possible way that we have today to eliminate what we call the double attribution problem, which is 
if you give money to a charity, the, 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 the simplest way to explain, if you give money to a charity, you get the same report as the other donor who gave money to the charity. And there's no way for you to know what amount of that impact is attributable to you. And blockchain solves that problem because it's really, really hard to make identical copies of that token. Um, but at the same time, it's just a technology that we use on the back end, and our job is to make sure that we solve a real problem for real people, whether we use blockchain or not, and it really doesn't matter which blockchain we use. So we talked a lot about trust and also traceability. Who, who drives the need for that, in your opinion? Who is, who is the, the key driver for that? I, I hope Generation Z. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think um, if you look at the internet and the development in the last 20, 30 years now, um, how much information do we really get from the products we are buying? And honestly, there are so many different kinds of labels and so many... I, I don't understand it anymore. Even I'm working now 30 years in this business. It's, it's really hard to make this comparison on the one side. On the other side, all this greenwashing... How can you compare the data and the information? You need to have trusted information to make a right product decision. Otherwise, it's useless. Yeah. So uh, you can adjust your, your your reporting schema in the way there are so many that you can't compare it. Impact investment is not possible because it's not comparable. And we need this trust. This is extremely important. I want to trust the information I'm getting. I don't want to, you know. So I think uh, we're still in a competitive world. So um, companies are incentivized to compete on this new technology. Um, what's interesting is that we see consortia play where they understand that this is going to be a shared infrastructure, um, that they're going to need to compete on other aspects. But um, there's, there's a drive in that sense. And then, as you've said, there's a, there's a, a generation gap. I think um, the millennial generation is, you know, wants to make a mark in the world. Um, it wants more sustainability, not only um, uh, about the things that they consume, but the companies they work for and uh, the projects or the, the companies they invest in. So it's a holistic approach to sustainability, trust, transparency, which I think is driving a lot of the conversation, and uh, will do so in the future too. And, and so much that it will become the norm. Um, you're not going to be able to do business without this. Okay, so we still, um, we have quite a large funding gap in our need for sustainable development. So there's still quite a lot of way to go uh, on that topic. And at the same time, we have quite a lot of regulatory uncertainty also with projects and initiatives like startups that are, that are working in the space. Um, where do you see the biggest challenges and how can we overcome them? If you can have a... We're not going to be able to use this room at 3.45. So I'm afraid okay. this is now the time for the audience. And if you would like to direct that question, are there any benchmarks against which we can measure social impact? Or is the original state a benchmark itself to your panelists? And then to close it, because otherwise we're going to have a traffic jam. Okay. I, I can speak to just the impact investor space. Um, there's an organization called GIN, uh, which drives the standards for impact investors. It allows you to have comparable impact metrics, also compare them through portfolio uh, holdings, etc. So this is sort of the standard. But what happens is that you really need to define what you want to change in the world, what you want to see in the world, and define some very simple metrics around that that entrepreneurs or companies are able to um, give you. Because sometimes when you're creating a company, you're a social entrepreneur, um, you have a lot of pressure, and maybe you don't have time to give all the information. So that's the standard. I, I actually like the idea of allowing the consumer to define these standards. Um, and that's because I think that there's, we, we are seeing a consumer trend now where consumers are actually very purpose-driven. Uh, they're seeking authenticity. And the same consumer are actually 
they've been educated by fake news, so they're very su they're suspicious of claims and of narratives. And I love that because that creates, that is our benchmark. If we please the demanding and the increasingly demanding consumers, we're going in the right direction. And then with time, we're going to optimize our own standards. I don't think we should spend too much time defining standards in laboratory, but let's just follow the trend on the market. Yes. Yeah, I can agree to both of this. Uh, there's not one standard today, there's multiple standards, and this is the problem to make it comparable, yeah? And um, the best thing would definitely be that the consumer is driving the direction here and giving us what's important for them. And for this, they need the trusted data to make a decision. Maybe a personal profile, personal profile where you are aligning, okay, I'm extremely want to see where is the material source, how is it recycled, what is the footprint. This is my profile and then I'm getting a matching to the product. So every product will not have one price tag only. It will have a lot of different kinds of information and data package if you buy it. So standard, multiple of them. And the question is how do we align them to come to one common standard and not to reinvent the wheel every, every, every day in multiple places. And this is more important than establish the blockchain is to establish a common way of thinking to come together to, okay, we agree to this, we move forward with this one direction. Hopefully we get this. Chad? I think um, my colleagues have said most of it, but I think I want to emphasize that as we are thinking about this, we should always think about the target population. And sometimes we make a lot of assumptions in terms of technology and what percentage of the population are literate and what percentage are illiterate. And I think it's very important to emphasize that we should start from them, then come to us. Because I think most of the practice, especially around blockchain, is that people sit somewhere and decide a lot of things, and then in a, they want to go implement it out there without really knowing the people that they're implementing it for. Yeah, I think with those words, we are kind of close the session, and I want to thank everyone for, for taking the time and sharing your, your experience with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Moderator, uh, for making sure that we all get to our very quick coffee break uh, because it will begin again here at 15.45 in Auditorium 1, 2 and the corner. Thank you.